next uh, part of the program. Uh, we'll, we'll start off with asking both Jody and Russell to get to tell us about their own, their some themselves and their own uh, journey through becoming a Pueblo potter. So if you would like to start, either one of you. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes, okay. My name is Jody Naranjo, and I'm a potter from Santa Clara Pueblo. Um, I probably am about seventh or eighth generation now. So becoming a potter was just kind of a real easy decision for me. Um, I didn't, I don't think I ever really had another option. Um, <laughs> you know, you kind of grow up making pottery from the time you're a young child, and you're sitting next to your mother, your aunt, your grandmother um, at Indian Market on the plaza selling little pinch pots. And so by the time I was about 15, I was sitting under the plaza on my own, um, selling little pots year-round, teaching high school, and um, you know, just really found the art itself just so beautiful um, and natural that um, it was, I never had any other um, ideas of anything else I wanted to do. That was it for me. So by the time I was, you know, 18, I was getting my own booth at markets and getting into galleries. And, you know, as a child, you kind of start um, copying designs. You know, you're copying designs because you're learning and your, your family's teaching how to make clay and polish and carve. And so I started copying designs and... Um, I think, you know, one morning you wake up and you just start seeing things differently and you want to make your own designs onto these pieces. Um, it's kind of in some ways crossing the line because is it then traditional? So for me, I thought, you know, if I'm going to be doing this the rest of my life, I'm going to do something that I enjoy and my interpretations because, you know, it is a little bit newer of a time for me to be coming into this. So why not use what is around me and my idea of traditional designs? So that was when I think my pottery became alive. Um, you know, my shapes were good. I went to IAIA. Um, my polishing was real iffy, but I found that I could carve. So um, I think you push what you're good at. So in order to make my pieces look the way that I wanted them to look, I just carved the whole pot because, you know, I was trying to cover polishing and shape flaws or whatever, but my carving was good. So I started carving the whole pot from bottom to top and inside and out, and it worked for me, you know. I kind of um, became known as somebody who just carves the whole pot, and I had fun with that, you know. I could sit, I could sit and bar for 15, 18 hours in a day without wanting to do a whole lot else. So, you know, my interpretations of the world and what I've seen and... You know, being a mom and being home with kids, you know, I think really made my my designs what they are. Um, you interpret life as you see it, you know, from a traditional view and a contemporary view. Um, so that's kind of where it's taken me, you know, here and, you know, here and there. <laughs> and to meet all of you guys and, you know, see all the different places and galleries and artists and everything that you know we see as artists and the native art world it's been an interesting journey so um any any questions or anything should i let russell speak Russell Sanchez. I'm from San Alfonso Pueblo. Uh, I started potting when I was about 12. Um, when I was about 14, I did a really, what I thought was a nice batch, so I put them outside my house to sell. Anita Day at that time had her studio, her shop at the Pueblo, so she came over and bought them all and told me to start taking everything to her. And so at that time I was doing really traditional black on black wear, which I had learned from my Aunt Rose Gonzalez. Uh, Tony Day was there working in the studio at her time, at that same time too. So he's the one that pushed me to do more of the inlay and the sienna and take the same clays and materials, traditional materials, but to push their boundaries. But the one thing that I was always told by my Aunt Rose is that, you know, do what you want, here's what we've taught you. 
but make it your own. Stick with the same materials, stick with the same uh, techniques, but go beyond what we're doing today. Because what's traditional today may not be tomorrow, or what's contemporary today will be traditional tomorrow. So I just went on and I showed the same galleries that Jody pretty much does. And right now I like to work a lot with larger forms and asymmetrical forms. And again, it's all in a traditional manner, but in a non-traditional viewpoint. So pretty much it. <laughs> any questions for any of us? So what are the challenges between, well, because all of you have shown that you work both large, larger scale and smaller scale, both the challenges of working in either side of that? Well, smaller scale, trying to keep it to scale. You know, if you're doing a pop this size, you want it, when you photograph it, you like it to look like a pop this size. So you want it to be as detailed and as fine. And the same with a larger pot, you want it to not look uh, over designed or over rushed. You want the scale of the design to work. I think we also find our comfort zones. You know, like I know Russell really works well on a large scale, and so do you, John, right? You guys work on a large scale very well. You know, when I start working on a large scale, um, it's a little overwhelming to me. I, my comfort zone is about this size, and I think that's when I work at my, my best. When a pot gets too big, I, you know, I get just overwhelmed. Um, my, my family calls them the nervous breakdown box. <laughs> you know, we've had to do interventions and get me out of the house and, you know, um, shower. <laughs> because I'll, I'll kind of, I'll lose it. So I try not to do too many of those. Instead, you know, I really like doing these pieces about this size. I think where you're comfortable, your, um, your hands, you know. My brother is a lot bigger than me, and he makes little pots. Um, where I make bigger pieces than him. So it becomes your comfort zone um, where you feel that not only the shape but the design that goes on the shape is um, a good mix for you as a, as a person. You know, it's the way you design Yeah, it. it has to be balanced. You know, you don't want to build a big pot and have it look just like a big blob. It should have form, symmetry. Even if it's asymmetrical, there should be some symmetry and just like he said, mm -hmm. balance. It should balance itself. To me, um, building in larger forms has been a huge lesson in patience. Um, Extreme. <laughs> you, you work a few coils, and then you have to step back and let it set up. And you, if you work too fast, it will collapse on you. And so you learn from those mistakes, and you learn to be very patient in, in doing that. <coughs> Especially with the type of clay that we use, mica clay is, is a lot stronger than our clay. We can't go as thin as they can go with a, a mica, hold, and it won't hold. It collapses. It will collapse. You can't bend it in as much. It'll just plop down on you. Also, um, Santa Clara and San Alfonso clay won't sit as long um, from layer to layer. Yeah. If I, you know, I try to have to get it all done in two days. Um, you know, if I let it sit for more than a few days and cover, even cover, there's going to be that um, point where it's uh, Where the clay, clay will shrink on the bottom mm -hmm. and not at the same the rate river, uh, yeah. at the, on the top. So then the coils will just tend to separate. And you'll get a crack in And when you polish the pot, you'll see them come out. Or when you fire the pot, you'll just see these little things, coil cracks going around. Yeah, yeah. We're, I see the, and because I've worked with uh, my, my caches for my animal sculptures. And I love that because you can do, you know, you can do just really crazy things. You can do antlers on deer, and, and that's really nice. Where Santa Clara clay and San Alfonso clay, we're basically using this clay that just boom, it just falls, falls down. I do add like a, a, a bowl of mica to my my mixture of Santa Clara clay um, for the strength, but also for um, the little bit of that glitter I like but I have to put it through an 80 mesh screen so I don't get the um, hardening. Yeah, if you if you it. try to slip a, a micaceous pot with our type of slip and burnish it, it won't bond. And it'll it will, peel it'll, off it'll peel the, and the it'll just start pitting <coughs> all over the place. So you gotta use like an 80 mesh screen to get that mica through, mm -hmm. which you won't get much mica through. But do you suppose ever possess Margaret to make those huge storage jars, which is this little 
I know. That's not that amazing to different. see this tiny Probably just one. her thing, again, like Jody uh-huh. was saying, her comfort zone. That's what she felt great at, and so she did it. I think what we do, too, is we, we, we're around family members that are doing so many um, different things. I mean, we all have a lot of family members who are in, you know, in, in clay or in different art forms. So we want to um, be different and push the envelope a little bit. You know, um, so I see where with Margaret, she, her tendencies, and she could make those big pieces. So probably that's where she pushed herself, because she was the person that could do that. Yeah, and nobody back then was making storage jars like right. that anymore. They kind of had died out, so yeah. she pushed it again and did it. Does so that make sense? You know, as far as uh, firing of your pots go, you always hear the scare story of an artist who has made pots and has gone to fire them, and two of them have had and they've, they've broken in, in the firing. As you make pottery, do you develop a formula sort of like a baker whose bread gets better and better? Uh, you do. Do you do the same thing when you fire pots? Like with me, depending on where, what pits I get the clay on at home, it just determines how much of the ash, help of volcanic ash to temper the clay. So it's like a recipe? Yeah. And, and then I find that the longer I let the clay sit before I actually use it, it just cures better. And the same when I'm building a pot, I just beat the hell out of it so all the air air is out. Yeah. And then after I build a pot, I won't finish it for at least six more months because again, it something happens and the clay just gets stronger and stronger. And when you fire it, it's not that big, big of a problem. And then when I fire, I fire one or two at a time. Now I won't do any more than that. Yeah, I do pretty much the same thing. I, I'll make all of my clay in um, September, October, and I'll store it for a year. It gets, starts building a little bit of a mold. Something just, yeah, it just yeah. gets better. And once that mold's on there, then I know it's, it's elastic. Um, the elas- elasticity of it is much better so that it's going to do a little bit more. Um, and then it holds <laughs> together. It, it somehow, it, it's like a curing, curing. Yeah, effect. something happens and it just gets better. I'll wait about two weeks after I build before I'll start you know, I, I won't wait six months. I, I don't I have that much patience. <laughs> but but I, I'll wait about two weeks before I start sanding and polishing it. And then, um, you know, the bigger the piece, I'll wait up to about a month. But I can find 12 days um, is the, the shortest amount of time I can for fire. It's like with me, some of the larger pieces I'll have sitting around for two to three years before I actually even start deciding to uh, polish them or start carving. You know, I have one more question for you, Russell. If I'm not, if I'm not incorrect, you put... Calabasas beads on your yeah. pots, do you not? Joe and Mary Calabasa from right. San Domingo. Well, uh, what I'm wondering about is uh, that's the finishing touch. Do they go on as a strand of beads or you do you hand place those? Uh, mostly as a strand. If I'm changing colors, then I have to take them off and rearrange them to balance it out. But the strand on the beads actually helps helps them stay a little more secure. So It's a mess if you, if you try to take the string out. It's a big mess. <laughs> and once you put that glue in there, you don't want to mess because if that starts going everywhere, it's hard to clean up. Right, I'm for John. Um, in some of your larger organic pieces, in terms of balance, do you weight the base at all? Is there any clay down there, or is it hollow all the way through and just the balance keeps it? Um, it's. It's, it's just the balance. I don't weight them um, from the bottom of the piece to the top is pretty much about the same thickness through the wall. It might get a little thinner towards the top, but um, it's not weighted. Um, one way I like to think of it is if you just draw a line down the center and you have this side and you have this side and you know, you've got to balance the two out. Whether it happens here or over here and then up here or vice versa, it doesn't matter, but it's got to balance out. Also, I, I wish you had had sizing on those <laughs> pictures because we don't have a clue. You said they started getting bigger, and then you showed the one, the heart shaped one. But were they all like the ones, the organic ones? How big are they? Well, a lot of my pots are anywhere from about two feet or so up to three and four feet tall. And one of the reasons I've I've enjoyed working in bigger shapes is a lot of, of Pueblo pottery that you see is a lot of smaller pieces and 
I felt like I wanted something to make a statement that, that stood out. Yeah. Um, again, a few of those, I was standing next to one while I was sanding it to kind of give you some scale. And also um, a picture of my nephew there standing there. The one with my nephew is probably from the floor, stands about this tall. Are you in a gallery? I do show at Blue Rain from time to time. Yeah. Um, a lot of people are, um, one of the first questions they ask when they're thinking about getting a piece of pottery is, is it fired outside or not? Could you speak to your choices and why you commit yourself to do the kinds of firing that you do? Well, I have always fired outside just because that's the only way I was taught. And, um, you know, I didn't know any other options. Um, so with me, you know, I just, I, in the mo I'll wait until the morning and I'll kind of look and if the leaves aren't blowing, you know, I go outside and I'll um, put some bricks on the ground and a piece of tin, I'll put the pot in there and um, put the, some like tin pieces around it and real layers of thin wood, light it up real slowly and then just start adding wood and adding wood until I feel like it's, you know, depending on the size, um, how it's going to, if it's going to be hard enough. I don't want to make it too hard because then I can't carve them because I do <laughs> carve after I fire them. So, you know, and also the color. If I was to do any other way, uh, way of firing, my pots would all be red. Right. And I prefer um, a chocolatey brown to like a, a gray color. Um, with so much carving on my pieces, you would not be able to see all that carving if the pot was red and, and tan. Um, when I do the dark colors and then the un un underneath is like a um, ivory color, it really shows my carving. So for me, that's my choice of, car of firing, you know, just because that's what I learned to do. My um, ceramic animals are kiln fired with, um, if I did it in a traditional way, they wouldn't be as strong. And you know, I have antlers, I have tails, I have eyes, and um, and long skinny legs. So they would just fall, almost fall apart if they were uh, traditionally um, fired. So I do kiln fire those, and I use a, a clay with a lot of mica in it so that it's stronger. Um, and that's the reasoning for that. I uh, <coughs> I only do a traditional firing. Again, that's what I was taught with uh, horse manure, cedar wood, and cow dung. And a lot of people have a hard time with firing, but I kind of quite enjoy it. Yeah, I do too. I think it's fun. It's, it's cool. It's like Christmas morning. Yeah, you open it up is. That box, it's so you don't know what get. And my pots tend to be fired quite high, and that's the only way I can get that uh, gunmetal look on some of the blackware, and to get the green to be very green. Otherwise, it turned into a brown shade. So are you doing reduction? Reduction and for the red wear, then I don't smother it with the uh, horse manure. I just use the cow, cow dung, and the cow dung tends to insulate the fire. And red cedar tends to burn very hot and fast. And fast, so I get it really hot. So My pots will actually glow it. white before I, I take them out of the fire. So what temperature do you think you get up to? I don't know. Hot. It's hot. <laughs> it's, it's very I hot. Burn it's burn 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 hot. Body parts it's not about two thousand. I'm not above 2,000, they would lose their luster. They would turn to glass, I think, at that. Yeah. Maybe 17, 18, I don't know, something like that. But it's hotter than normal. He fires higher than I do, because when we work together, when I tried to carve on his, after his pieces are fired, it was incredibly hard. So I do know his, you know, his he fires higher than I do. See, I, I was taught to fire the pots for use, because at San Alfonso, we still use a lot of pots, so they have to hold food or whole water. Yeah, and my family never has used them. I've just always fired that way and like I said, I enjoy it. And I find the pot is very durable after you fire it that high. Mm -hmm. But I do all my carving before firing, so <laughs> it's not like her. It would, it's not that Well, that I'm afraid difficult. to touch it because the polish will come off. You know, so I, I mean, I put them in there, I cover them and you know, I have a house full of people and animals and stuff. so. You know, I cover everything up and you know, I want to fire it as soon as possible so that it can be touched. Um, you know, with all that carving, I, it would be impossible for me to handle it so much. I'll spend a month carving a piece and you know, I'll, I'll just, my polish would be a total mess. 
I wear gloves. <laughs> to me, firing is, is its own art form in itself. Um, you could spend years and years playing around with different firing techniques outside. Um, I, I, I don't mind using a kiln or the traditional firing technique. I think if you do work in traditional clay, it is very important to undergo some traditional firings because I think that that is a huge part of it. Um, but I, I, I don't mind doing either one. Um, I do find some people that, that um, build in larger forms and have a lot of time put into the pot will sometimes use the kiln because it is a little bit easier. Um, with Jody's stuff, with her carving, a lot of that happens after the firing. So she yeah. knows that she has that the piece is already fired and she can really go I'm not. Carving. I'm not going to lose all that carving yeah. time mm -hmm. because yeah. I haven't carved it. And then there are other, are other pots like, um, you know, the deep carving that's done in the clay and that is all done before the firing. So when you do see pots like that that are fired, there was a tremendous amount of work mm -hmm. that went into it that could be lost in a traditional fire. I do all my incising everything except the inlay before okay. firing. And then also, if I did not fire that high when I'm reoxidizing to expose the other colors when you use a blowtorch, the pot is heated up so high again that it'll just blow up if, if it's not already uh, put through that. they would be harder yeah. but yeah. again it's finding what she was comfortable with you know yeah. that was her calling yeah. some we're, potters we're, will specialize in large others just prefer to do miniatures and or with the symmetrics you know trying yeah. to make a pot symmetrical is difficult for me so instead of trying to make it symmetrical I go I go the opposite you know I'll make it asymmetrical or I'll give it some crazy shape because you know that's my comfort zone so you know we find our I, we all start with the same thing and you know what comes out of it is basically your personality but also what you're comfortable with and what you're good at you're pushing those you know you're pushing you're pushing like Russell can polish like no I've never seen anybody be able to polish like Russell um, and you know that's where he shines is his his polishing the shapes um, you know so we all have our weaknesses and our and are things you know that we want to push in that direction. I think just the the um, the Mother Earth clay really kind of dictates to every potter kind of what avenue and gives them different signs and a different path in a way that they're going to build their pottery. And you know, um, in the example you're talking about, you know, maybe it was just time for her to change directions, and that was her calling to go towards the storytellers as opposed to, you know, the pots. Um, See, like, to me, I just felt a calling towards my caseous clay, you know, um, and just more of the simple, you know, um, shapes with no designs on them, you know. Um, Jody has, you know, very intricate carving, which is just, you know, something that was embraced by, you know, by her calling through the clay, you know, and, and Russell in his own way as well. And so we just all, I think that the the clay itself really kind of, in a mysterious way, kind of guides you. It well. tells you what to do. It's like when we're describing a pot at home, we, we call the base the butt, the bottom. And this is the body, then you have the shoulders, then you have the neck, and then you have the mouth. And then when we're dressing the pot, the slip would be the clay mother's dresses, her outfit. When you're firing the pot, then she's finished and ready to go out. So we're told also when a pot breaks or whatever, it's like, well, it wasn't time for that one to be born. It's interesting how it's uh, your calling that takes you in a certain direction. And it was always interesting to me that Helen's uh, grandfather was a storyteller in mm -hmm. Pueblo. And, and that's, that's the direction that 
you know, we're always told that the clay mother tells us, well, here I am, make me pretty, make me beautiful, and do it in the way that you know, or the way that comes out with your hands, so. The clay that uh, your two Pueblos use, and you can uh, do the reduction and make the black pots and so forth, I'd always heard that um, they didn't really hold water. They were not if you fire them high enough, they will. That's what I wondered. They mm -hmm. really can do the same thing, just depending upon the... I mean, it's the same clay base that was used in the early Santa Clara, San Alfonso polychrome ware. If it's fired properly and long enough and hot enough, it will. When I do wedding vases, um, I will fire them higher because I know that you know there there's going to be water put in the in the wedding vase. So I do fire them. Um, either I'll do the first firing and then I'll carve it, and then I'll do a second firing. But you know, I do put about a thirty minute limit on on the pot. I'll tell them you know you get about thirty minutes to put the water and get it out of there because it's going to start to bleed through a little bit because my firing isn't as nice. See, when, when we use a pot at home for ceremonies and stuff, water bowls and all that, some ceremonies left 12, uh, last 12 days, so yes, they've yeah, got yeah, to I hold for a, 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 a long time. Yep. I don't have a clay. All, all, all traditional clay can be um, have a, a, a black um, color put to it. It can have a reduction firing. That's just mainly done with infusing carbon into the pot that creates that black color. So it can be done at a high temperature? It can be done at any temperature. It's not necessarily a temperature thing. It's more of, a, of an atmosphere of either <coughs> oxygen or a lack of oxygen. A lack of oxygen having the carbon. Much like you take a lighter and stick it under your hand, you get a little black spot. It's the same thing. You're just infusing that carbon smoke into the pot. And when a pot is warm, it's much like the pores on our skin where it will open up and it will allow that carbon, the black, to fuse in there. And if you were to take a pot and break it and look at a cross piece of the pot, you would actually see that the carbon is soaked into the clay body itself and not just on the outside. It'll be gray pretty much all the way through. Yeah. I know in the micaceous ware that you cook in, um, you usually seal it. Do you seal any of your pots? Uh, we seal it with, we take a pot of boiling water, you dip it in there for a short time, you pull it out, and you take lard, regular lard, rub it in, and the lard somehow melts in there and it'll seal it up again. Yeah, and usually do that with a little bit of heat so that it'll again kind of absorb in there. It's much like seasoning a, uh, a cast yeah, iron a cast iron pot. Yeah. So I noticed that your pieces don't have fire clouds. Is that a choice that you made? Well, some of the pieces that you see without the fire clouds are um, pieces that were fired in a kiln, so you don't have any wood involved with them. Um, I did show you a plate there, the moon plate I called it, and that one is done outside um, where you are infusing a lot of that carbon to get a lot of those blacks and gray colors. Um, a few of the other pieces you did um, my black beans were done the same way, infusing the carbon into them. Um, and there were a few pieces in there that had some very subtle um, smoke clouds in there. Um, when I do fire, I kind of tend to go to one side or the other. I'd like a clean firing, or I really embrace it and really try and get the blacks and grays. Um, I don't really kind of do in between that much, but that's just a personal preference. With my firing, what I do is, you know, when the pot, the fire is really hot, I um, go in with uh, just a rake and I pull away all of the, all of the um, wood and the, the hot coals, and then the tin pieces that are just kind of covering the pot to protect it from the wood. And I take everything out and I put, instead of smothering it in manure, which would turn it black, black all the way through, I get manure and I put it around the piece um, without touching it, and then I'll put some of the pieces kind of lean the uh, tin back over it, so it's like this, so just so that the the reduction and the smoke goes around the piece pretty um, consistently, but not all the way through the pot. So that when I carve it, I'm carving off the surface, and the inside of the pot is still white, it's still like a you know off white color, and um, and that's my preference 
because I do want, if I did black on black, my, half my carving you wouldn't see. You wouldn't see it unless you looked really up close or felt it. So I want that white to come out um, in my carving so that it's visible. That's why I do the, the manure around without touching the piece. So that's my difference in firing techniques. I don't do smoke. You don't do smoke? You, you, you don't you work bury them yours. You, don't work. <laughs> you, don't, you don't bury them or you, you smother them? I smother them. You smother them. Or you don't smother them? I do smother them. Oh, them. Not all of them, not the red. Okay. With a kiln, you can't do the reduction, can you? No. Well, you could fire a piece in a kiln, and once it's done, then you could take it outside as a fired piece and refire it and introduce carbon to it and turn it black if you'd like. Like raccoon. That, that is, yeah, kind Pretty of like much, raccoon, yeah. yeah. But it doesn't necessarily, in raccoon though, you want the piece hot, take it into the carbon atmosphere right away. Whereas with your question, I could fire a pot, have it this orange gold color, it could sit for a year, and then, oh, I decide I want to turn it black, take it outside and refire it and infuse the carbon into it and turn it black. You can do that with my cages. You can do that with any clay body. I find it really hard to get the red pots. Um, I don't know if... It's a higher temperature. I, and, and that makes me, it ner <clears throat> makes me so nervous because then I can't carve them. To get a, a nice like, red, you have to go higher. Yeah, and I don't, I never go that high. Have any of you looked outside, uh, not necessarily for direct inspiration, but a non-native ceramicists, I'm thinking Ken Price, Volkos, Ron Nagel, those, does any of that speak to you at all? Um, when I was a kid, I did see a uh, Ken Price show um, at the Harwood Museum in Taos, and I was blown away at how such a tiny little teacup could be worth so much money. <laughs> <laughs> and I always scratched my head from that and just very wondered about that. Um, but I do remember that, and I have been influenced by Ken Price. Um, there was the one piece in there that was a white piece that was very sculptural that does kind of um, resemble a Ken Price piece. Um, at the time, though, I wasn't fully aware of, of all of the, the pieces that he's done as well. Um, but I am very fond of his work. Um, I also do like the way R.C. Gorman's work as well. I, I really find um, just how simple his stuff was, but yet how complex his pieces were as well. And so I try and find that a little bit in my pieces as well, of these nice, clean, flowing lines, um, but yet kind of a simple, a simple de designs, but yet kind of complex at the same time. Lately, I've been influenced quite a bit by uh, Japanese potters. Mm -hmm. Just the simplicity of form, shape. Very hard to make, but yet they look so graceful. Sharp angles and stuff like that. And I've tried doing that lately, and it's kind of working. I think with my work, I think I, you know, I'm more influenced by painters. You know, when I make a pot, I find the pot to be an empty canvas. You know, the pot, you know, I'll work with the shape and I'll give it the, but then I'll sit it and look at this pot and this pot and how, what am I going to put on all over this pot? I'm going to carve it from top to bottom. And so for me, I'll look at painters um, or, um, you know, printmakers. I, I, you know, I've done pots like uh, MC Escher, you know, with the combining of fish to birds or, you know, just all this different stuff going on. You know, pop artists. He, uh, yeah, Keith Haring, like Jim has my Keith Haring pot yeah. back there. And, and I'm working now, I'm making kusharis, doing right. the, the, the Keith Haring <laughs> dancing man thing, you know, so I've been working on that piece. But I like to bring in, um, I, I find it in the design aspect um, on what I'm putting on the piece more than in the shape um, or coloring because that's where I look at the design is on what's on it, not actually the shape, but <coughs> what's going on all over it. You know, like the the figures, <coughs> the figures, and the so that's why I look at painters more than I do as pot potters and designers. I tend to go for <coughs> a lot of shape. Yeah, he really I is love shape, shape, form, architectural shapes. I like that a lot. Russell, in your polishing over the years, have you developed any new techniques or 
new materials, new stones, new ways of doing things? Because Pretty much, I still do it the same way. It's because like that recipe works so well. <laughs> you don't want to mess with it. You try to mess with it, you know. It doesn't get better, it can get worse. <laughs> yeah, you get that stone. And you get that stone, stone and yeah, the more stone you use the stone, stone, the better it gets. Better, the better it gets. The stones I use belong to my grandma and to my Aunt Rose. You have certain stones for different shapes, different weights for, you know, different style of slip. I just have one stone, but, you know, he's the master polisher. So <laughs> if, I can, if I can get the polish on there pretty good, I'm pretty happy to come the car all over it anyway, you know? With me, if it's not polished right, I'll strip it down and do it again. Yeah, and I've, I've told them a couple I, times, I, like, I, I can't, can't get the polishing on there, I can't get the polishing on there, and he goes, well, take it all off and do it again. And I'm like, no! <laughs> I'll just carve it all, I'll just carve it all off. <laughs> One thing I've started doing is uh, turning the shower on in the bathroom and creating a lot of humidity. And if I'm going to do a big pot in there, I'll be in there for several hours and just work and work and work and it keeps the slip moist long enough to be able to polish the whole surface so you don't get scratch marks and it doesn't dry out on you it'll dry in about 10 minutes if you don't figure out if you don't you gotta move fast you can't quit once you start Um, a a big pot that you see very nice polish all the way around it is very tricky thing to achieve if you look at tammy garcia's pots she has very big pots but if you and she has very good polishing but she's broken up all of her different um, sections, so then she can go in and do section by section. It's much more difficult to polish a plain pot than a design pot. If you're doing a design yeah, pot, you can sections. break it up into sections. Which I, I definitely do. I put I polish all kinds. And of if you're good enough, you'll be able to join the two sections. But if you do that, you've got to do the second section immediately after you do the first part, while there's still some moisture in this part. So they bond, yeah. But you got to be careful for, um, well, if you join them and it's not joined right, then you can get a lot of blistering when you fire the pot. You know what I do is I put them in the refrigerator um, because it keeps it cold. And so when I put the slip on, my pots are cold and it's more likely to stay wet longer. So that's something I found. In the refrigerator. I, I put them in the refrigerator. I you know my ears are like, oh, there's a pot in the refrigerator. I was like, don't touch the pot. Those are, you know, I'm going to polish them. But I will leave them in the refrigerator for about a day, and then I pull them out early in the morning when it's a little humid, and then I'll go for it with polish. But that, it helps me in the refrigerator. I found that to be a little trick. You never tried that one? Try it. <laughs> it's a little off the traditional method, but... Well, thank all of you for coming out today and for you to join me and uh, thanking all these potters for it's been a real privilege.